Amen. Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Hudson Valley. Psalm 40, verses 4 and 5 say, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you plan for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. So we're going to sing today. We're going to worship him. We're going to thank him for all the great things that he's done. And let's just start that off together.
Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. And Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come.
streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by fading tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it mount of to leave the God I love. Use my heart alone. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of Praise you, Father. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. 
all that you've done in our lives, Lord. We thank you for your, how you restored us, renewed us, how you revealed yourself to us, Father. Lord, help us, Lord, never, never to forget the depths that you have saved us from, uh, that you've taken us from, Lord. Thank you that you're our strong tower, our hiding place, Father. We find our life and our existence in you. Lord, please take our hearts, Lord, and seal it. Keep us, Father, from wandering. Keep our eyes on you. Keep us on the path, Lord God. Be glorified here tonight. I pray, Lord, you'd be with Pastor Billy as he gives forth your word, Lord. We thank you, Father. Lord, we pray you even be with the kids as they're being ministered to by, by, by your servants, Lord. Be glorified in this place. We love you, Father. We ask you to bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hey, you guys, thanks so much for coming out. What a great crowd. We're just uh, so welcome uh, to have you guys. Uh, why don't you guys just greet one another, and we'll get on with the announcements. All righty. Good evening, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Hudson Valley's midweek service. We're so happy you could join us. If you are joining us for the first time, we would love to connect with you. Please fill out a welcome card located in the back of the seat in front of you. You may drop it off in one of our tithing boxes or to an usher. If you are joining us in person, we ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time. Before we get to today's message, we want to go over some weekly announcements with you. The Abound Women's Ministry is currently studying the attributes of God. We invite you to either our Tuesday evening study at 7 p.m. or our Friday morning study at 10 a.m. Both the evening study and the morning study are held here at Calvary. Bible study workbooks are available in the church bookstore for $10. Child care is provided for the Friday morning study only. The Marriage Bible Study, Friend for Life, will be meeting on Thursday, April 25th at 6.30 p.m. here at Calvary in the Solid Ground Cafe. They will be reading through the Sacred Marriage Book. This book is available for purchase in our bookstore. Come out for a time of strengthening and encouragement. Childcare is available. The men's ministry will be having their men's breakfast on Saturday, April 27th here at Calvary. Doors open at 8 a.m. Sign up is available in the church lobby. Our men's conference will be held on Friday, May 3rd to Saturday, May 4th, right here at Calvary. Men 13 years of age and older are invited for a time of fellowship, teaching, worship, and encouragement as we look at the importance of walking in obedience with the Lord. Registration cost is $20 and available online at ccohb.org. Hi everyone, Trista here. I just wanted to take a minute to tell you about our upcoming Family Spring Festival happening Saturday, May 18th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. We will be having relay races, games, food, cotton candy, and more. In order to make this event happen, we need your help are available in the lobby to help with the very special things we have planned. This is a free event, but we are using this opportunity to collect items for the CareNet Pregnancy Center. See the table in the lobby for more details. Hey, you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening. As Bobby would say, you guys are the real Christians. You came out in the rain, you know, with this foul weather. Just a couple of quick announcements we just want to follow up with uh, before I introduce uh, Pastor Billy. Uh, just quickly, if you guys, at the end of the service, because we, you hear all that's going on. So number one, as Trista was saying, there's sign-up sheets in the back just to volunteer to help out. Um, we have a lot of events going on. It's a really great outreach to our community. Um, um, again, where people won't, won't step foot in church, but they'll come to an event like that. You can ask someone to come and open that door, you know, uh, uh, 
fellowship and hopefully that they'll make their way out here. So if you could sign up for that. Also, at the end of this service, we're going to be stacking the chairs again because we have the women's lunch in here. There's a lot going on. Also, guys, if you want to, um, I think the, they already signed up for the ladies, but guys, we, could, we have a sign-up list in the back for that as well. You can see uh, Pastor Joel or Steve. They're going to be running the event um, uh, that Saturday. But many hands make light work. You know what I mean? It's just a lot going on, as you see, uh, that we're having here. Also, keep in prayer. We have a lot going on as far as our, our men's conference. Please pray for that. Invite somebody. Uh, it's a great time, Friday and Saturday. It's $20. You, 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 you're not going to leave here hungry, spiritually or physically. It's just a wonderful time. So please sign up. Try to get a friend. Without further ado, I just want to introduce Pastor Billy. Also, Pastor Billy has a friend of his, uh, Pastor Daniel. Daniel, why don't you come up also? Uh, Billy's from uh, Calvary Chapel Grace in Tuxedo, New York. You guys know Billy. Billy's going to be one of the guys teaching also on our, 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 our men's conference. So be, uh, please be a part of that. But Pastor Billy just got um, a lot, lot going on with, with Pastor Daniel. And just he's doing a great work in Costa Rica. And I will let Billy explain all that's taking place there. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, guys. Good evening. Good to see you guys. And uh, always a pleasure to be here. It's kind of like a home away from home. And uh, it's good to be with you guys out on a Wednesday night. Uh, it's the truth, and uh, this is Pastor Daniel Rojas from Costa Rica, a very close friend of mine. Yeah, you can give him a round of applause. Um, you know, I don't know how long, maybe maybe about a year and a half ago, uh, I was uh, encouraged and invited and asked to go to a trip down there to uh, just kind of almost vet the work that God's doing there, to see uh, there was, you know, we had heard all of these things about child sex trafficking, you know, that you had that movie that came out, and um, uh, and I was kind of went down there, and first couple of days, I'm kind of watching this guy, and getting to this home, and seeing these children, and as a, as, a, as a New Yorker, and somebody who basically looks at everything like it's a con, I pretty much thought that's what it was. <laughs> it's true. But as I was there, and just watching what God was doing there, uh, my heart began to break, and uh, God began to put on my heart individually just that uh, the Lord had a purpose, not only for rescuing these children, because it's incredible. I've been there, I think, six or seven times now. Uh, and to see little children that were rescued at five years old, uh, traumatic, traumatic, real situations. I've held these kids. I've touched, you know, I've heard from them and, and uh, you know, heard from the psychologists and all these things. But then to watch, even better than the rescue, to watch the Lord change their lives. It's unbelievable. Like, unbelievable. You know, uh, truly, it's incredible to see it. So I just want to give, you know, uh, Pastor Bobby said, if you're bringing Daniel out, I want you to teach on Wednesday. I said, okay, okay, I'll come teach. So we're still going to have a Bible study, don't worry. But, you know, give Daniel a round of applause. He's going to share with you a little bit about what God's doing there. Thank you very much, brother. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you guys here. And as pastors say, the Lord has called us there in Costa Rica uh, to do something that is not really easy, but it is amazing. We are rescuing these children from child sexual exploitation, organ harvesting, and a lot of different things that are not the best. But as the brothers say, uh, you know what? You learn very easy to take apart, different what is happiness and joy. How is that? We're not happy. For what we do, meaning that every time that we rescue a child, you got to hear all their stories and everything they have gone through. Meaning that uh, children, eight, seven, six years old, they were sexually abused up until 10 times per day. And then you come and you want to say to them, God loves you. And you know what is the first thing they say? If God loves me, if God loves me, why would he allow for this to happen to me? Because of that, uh, and don't stone me yet when I say this, because of that, we don't share the gospel to them as soon as they come to us. Why is that? Because, we shared, because before we share the gospel to them, the first thing we do is we show the gospel to them. They got to understand first, through our example, through everything that we do, that God is love. How? Through the way how we love them. It is a lot of things. We have 110 children right now there. And there's a lot to do. But let me just tell you very quick. We need your prayer because we cannot do this alone. 
This is a very strong satanic uh, fight that we have there. Rescuing these children from those places where they are coming, bringing them to our refuge, to our home, and give them hope. That's what the Lord has called us to do, to give them hope. But let me finish with this very quick. So you can pray, you know, pray with us and for us and for them over there, okay? The name of our children's home is actually Little Starfish. Have you ever heard the story of the starfish? Well, I'm so glad that you asked so I can tell you what, okay? There was one day a man walking on the beach and he saw thousands and thousands of starfish all over the sand. So at the distance, he saw a little child running to the water, coming back outside, going back to the water, and coming back outside. So he wanted to see what he was doing. So he walked to the child and asked him, what are you doing? And the child says, because of the low tide, the water went back, right, and left all these starfish outside. And because it's so hot right now, if I don't save them, they will die. And the man says, there's so many starfish, you're not going to make no difference. The child got one starfish, went to the water, put it back in the water, came back and said, I made a difference in that one. We might not rescue all of them. We might not rescue all of them. But we want to make the difference in those that we rescue. And we want to ask you to pray for us so we can, you can, you and us, you know, we can make the difference in their life. So thank you very much for all what you do and keep us in your prayer. Thank you. Amen. 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 So, so good to be with you guys. Uh, after the service, Daniel will be kind of in the back foyer. You could ask him questions. You know, that is like a talk about a little sliver of what is happening there. It's legit. Um, it's special. You know, I've been talking to Pastor Bobby about it, and, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've taken two teams from our church that have been there, visited the home, ministered to the kids. I promise you, you know, it's, it's incredible. Uh, there's so much work to be done. And like Daniel said, you know, it's the starfish thing. You know, it's like you're getting one at a time. You can't rescue them all, but to watch the kids get rescued and to watch their lives change, incredible, incredible. Even if you have a young, young teenager or whatever that's not like, you know, super into Jesus or something like that, I bring them because it's kind of like uh, I, I used to play football and, uh, you know, I remember one time I got knocked out and my coach broke the, uh, the salt on my nose. I woke up. I'm, I think this is the, the salt, you know, the break, that, that, that thing that's just going to wake up this next generation for the gospel. So, amen? amen. And uh, so just something to be praying for. You can talk to him afterwards and uh, Get more information from them. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open those up. We're going to be in John chapter 3 tonight. John chapter 3, and you might go, oh, I know. John 3, 16. Nope, John 3, verse 22, we're going to start. And then we're going to go through verse 36. If you need a Bible, I see these good-looking guys here uh, passing out the Bible. So get that. At our church, we say, if you don't have a Bible, uh, that's our gift to you. But uh, I, uh, I would say this as well. If you have 10 of these in the back seat of your car, bring some of them back to church. Okay. So that's it, you know, <laughs> or give them out. But we're going to be in John chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 22 through 36. If you're taking note this evening, the title to the message is seven words that, that will change everything, that will change your life. Seven words that will radically change your life. And I'll tell you in advance, those seven words are in John 3 verse 30 if you want to look at them. But we're going to talk about this tonight. You know, seven words that will change your life. Uh, Jesus, as we pick it up here, has just got done finishing talking with Nicodemus. And that's that Nick at night conversation. Remember this? Jesus is there, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the teacher of Israel. This was an intellect. This was a religious man. This was probably a man that was a lot better than me before I came to know Christ. Like a good person, the, the, the prototypical person that thinks, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. And he comes to Jesus at night and says, you know, good teacher, you know, what must a man do? What, what do we have to do to go to heaven? And he says, Nicodemus, you know, unless a man is born again, right? Isn't that incredible? And he moves on to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? That whosoever, what, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But we're going we're gonna to pick it up after that together tonight. We're going to see this. And, and I believe that John chapter 3, verse 1 through 21 is 
is, uh, is the keys to salvation or justification, where we get born again and we're changed and we're, God now sees us just as if I never sinned. But now, church, you know, and I knew we were going to be here on a Wednesday night, so I always call our Wednesday night crew, you guys are the Navy SEAL Christians, you know. So now we're going to talk tonight about the next step of s- salvation. It's not justification, it's called sanctification. Sanctification. Where God begins to change us. And I want to tell you something tonight. Sanctification, it will bless you. It'll it'll bring you to a place that's better than where you're at now. Following Jesus and being changed by Jesus is a blessing, right? Amen? Amen. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. So let's pray and then we're going to dive in. Father, thank you. Thank you for Pastor Bobby, for Pastor Mike. Thank you for Calvary Chapel, Hudson Valley. Thank you for those shirts that say Calvary Chapel, New York. Lord, you know... You know how much I love this place and how much, Lord, you love this state and these people. And we we have so much work to do. But, Lord, we know it's not us doing it, like Paul says, but it's Christ in us. It's, It's not I, but Christ in I. And, Father, tonight we pray that you would touch us, you would change us, that your word would have an effect on our minds, our hearts, our families. Lord, just our holiness. Lord Jesus, every part of us, Lord, our heart towards children being trafficked around the world, Lord, that you would just continue to to give us ears to hear, Lord, what your spirit is saying to us, even here tonight. And God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, most of you guys know this. I have five children. Um, You know, I grew up, you know, in a single parent house and, uh, you know, lived a life of sin, got born again. I've shared this story with you. Some of you are like, who is this guy? I've never heard from him before. And that's good. That's lucky. You're lucky you never heard me. But anyways, But, you know, it's amazing. Every day I wake up, I go, I can't believe that I'm a dad. You know, one of the great, my great fears is, you know, I didn't have a dad, so I always say, Lord, I don't know how to do this. And the Lord always reminds me, yeah, you do. I taught you how to do it. I'm your father. Just be like I am with you with them. And I always tell them, that's impossible, Lord. But, you know, we've got five kids, and our fourth son, his name is Judah. And out of all our kids, uh, Judah is probably the most like me. You know, he's, he's bad. He doesn't listen. Right, he's rebellious, but he's just likable. Now you're thinking you're not very likable though, so that's the part that's not like you, which is probably true. But this kid, he's so funny. We, you know, we have on our kitchen table we have this big bowl. You probably have this with fruit. I mean, I don't eat fruit, but my wife buys fruit, you know, and she eats it. And she, there's always apples in it, always apples in this bag. And my son Judah will go over. He'll take an apple. He'll walk. He'll take one bite out. He'll walk around the house. He'll put it down. He'll go back. I mean, this kid will go through a bag of apples in about 15 minutes. So the other day I was in the house, it was Monday, it's my day off, and, and, and my son Judah takes his like fifth apple out, and he takes a bite out of it, and my, my wife says, put that back. So he literally takes the chunk out of his mouth, puts it in the apple, puts it down, and looks at her and smiles. And I go, that is my son right there, you know, that's him. Listen, brothers, sisters, tonight, you know, John 3.16 is, is justification. You know, if you're here tonight and you have said yes to Jesus Christ, If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. You are a child of God. When God sees you, he sees you just as if you never sinned. If you came here tonight and you have just had the week from, you know, from hell, you have had, you've just been stumbling and bumbling. You come in here with, you know, just sin, just, you know, I always, I always refer to sin like stepping in a pile of dog poo, you know, and you're just tracking it into church tonight and the ushers are vacuuming up behind you. If that's you, but you are a child of God, I want to tell you something. God sees you tonight just as if you never sinned. He still loves you. I want to tell you tonight, I've been walking with the Lord for probably two decades now. I'm married for, I'm going to be 20 years married. It's insane to me. I tricked this woman so bad. It's insane. If you ever meet my wife, it's kind of how Pastor Bobby and Liz are. It's, a, it's very similar. I'm insane, and my wife is so proper and wonderful, and people always feel so bad for her. It's true. 20 years. But I tell you, the amount of grace that I've received from the Lord is incredible. You know, the amount of times I've come to the Lord and say, you know, I think that's it, right? If you can lose your salvation, I probably lost it. And the Lord reminds me, no, you're my son. But as I've grown in my walk with the Lord, one of the great privileges is to be changed by Jesus. To be able to communicate to other people, I know for a fact that God can take a sinner and little by little, and you still struggle, but change you. Change you. And how I know it, I mean, I know it because the Word of God says it. I also know it because it's happened in my life. 
But that's what we're going to look at tonight. It's these seven words that can change everything, and we're going to see it here in the text. So we're going to pick it up. John chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 22, and, and we're going to switch from Jesus uh, speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus telling Nicodemus, God so loved the world. Jesus telling Nicodemus, John 3, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And we pick it up, verse 22, after these things, so after this conversation with the Pharisee, with, with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. So now Jesus will leave Jerusalem, which is in the south. He'll leave kind of the capital district. He had presented himself as the king of the Jews. Remember how he presented himself. He went into the temple and he started flipping over tables. Uh, I had to do a memorial service recently, but the person who was, do, who was heading it up says, I don't want you to talk about anything religious. I said, that's no problem. I'll just talk about Jesus. <laughs> and they said, well, Jesus is religious. I said, I'm going to tell you, I will talk about what Jesus thinks about religion. And I talked about John 2 where Jesus goes in and he flips over the tables. They were like, what is this guy talking about? Like, Jesus is not about religion. It's not about religion. Make sure as you're communicating the gospel in this world, you make sure people know it's not about religion. Jesus wasn't about religion. Religion it comes from the Latin word relinquere. It's man's attempt to relink with God. Jesus knew you couldn't relink with God. I couldn't relink with God. I remember when I first got saved, people would, uh, they, it was that song. It was very popular. Remember that? I found Jesus. How many of you guys remember that song? I found, I couldn't sing that song. I didn't find Jesus. <laughs> I used to sing it. I'd be like, I ran from Jesus. That's what I did. Because that's the truth. But Jesus came and found me. He did. Jesus went into Jerusalem, presented himself as king, but they didn't want him as king. Why? He flipped over the tables. He said, in order for me to be your king now, there needs to be repentance. So they'll reject him, and now he will go to the north, to Judea. And there, verse 22, he remained with them, and he baptized. So Jesus begins to baptize you know, if you fast forward to chapter 4, you'll see that Jesus actually uh, didn't baptize. Verse, chapter 4, verse 2 says, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. So his ministry was baptizing, but it was really the disciples. And watch this. He remained with them and baptized. Verse 23, now, now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because it says there was much water there. You know, often ministry is very practical. You know, I think sometimes in Christianity, we, we are waiting for like our, the, the Cheerios in our cereal bowl to line up and tell us where God wants us to serve. I'm serious. You know, it's like, you know, and listen, if you don't feel called to help rescue children, that's up to you. But like, I, I kind of think as Christians today, it's like, it's go time. You know, it's like, what are we talking about here? You know, like, you know, God bless all those people. And, you know, if you're here and you're going vote in November, and I think you should vote. I think you should. Do I think it's going to change much? I don't think it's going to change much. I think the problem in America is the heart of America. I think people need to be born again. I never smoked marijuana because Nancy Pelosi said it was legal. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you the truth. I never considered that. I was like, you know, where I grew up, we used to ride our bikes and get alcohol at 10 years old. I never did that because it was legal. If it was legal, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I would have found something that was illegal to do, right? I'm, I'm sorry, and maybe that's too much for us here tonight, because you guys are the Navy SEALs, right? <laughs> but I'm, I'm being honest here, right? You know, we kind of see that. I think we make this too complicated. J John the Baptist was baptizing in Anon, well, because there was water there, and people needed to be baptized. People needed to be called to repentance. It, it was time for the kingdom to come. I think we're in that time, brothers and sisters. I think we're in the time tonight. Jesus is going, I want to move, but I think he, he, he doesn't want to leave the kids at home, you know? He wants us to come with him on this trip. And, and he's baptizing in Anon because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. Verse 24, now John had not yet been thrown into prison. Remember, John will get thrown into prison because he'll call, he'll call him out on you know, his adultery, the Herod. Verse 25, then there arose a dispute. And don't ever be afraid for little disputes in the body of Christ. It's, it's just the cost of Jesus saving sinners like you and I. Between some of John's disciples, but it was with the Jews about purification. They were arguing with John's disciples, guys, so you understand. They were saying that Jesus' disciples didn't know how to wash their hands properly. Just think about this. Jesus is coming to literally be massacred on a cross and then raised from the dead, and the Pharisees are talking about how Jesus' disciples don't wash their hands. The, the Jewish way was you wash your hands and you lift your hands up and you let it drip down your elbow. 
Just imagine Jesus looking at him going, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to teach everybody. The Sermon on the Mount, let me stop. This is how you wash your hands. You know, it's like, it's wild. You know, only Pharisees can make the gospel complicated. You know, the message of the gospel is so simple. It's so simple. I remember when the gospel was presented to me, I was, I was actually with a buddy of mine. And we, were, we, were, we were businessmen selling things that are legal now. We would have been legal businessmen. And they told me about Jesus. This girl came and said, I, God told me to tell you something. Oh, yeah. You must have already gotten some of our stuff here, right? And, and she said, you know, he told me to tell you he's real. She didn't know this, but God, in, in my heart, my mom was going to the Calvary Chapel cult where we were living, you know. I was like, this woman joined the cult. They're all smiling. This is not what religious people are like. She goes to church all the time now. She brings me home Christian stuff. Like, I'm going to walk out of the house with a Jesus loves you t-shirt. I was like, what's wrong with this woman? And you know what? God sent this girl to tell me what I needed to hear. It's what happened. She, it if Mike Tyson would have hit me. It would have, he wouldn't have hit me as hard as she hit me. Because the God Almighty hit me, right? It's powerful stuff, this, this Jesus stuff. And this is what we see here. You know, this dispute arises, but the Pharisees, they love to talk about nonsense. Verse 26, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, they're speaking to John the Baptist, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Listen, tonight if you're taking note, the first point I want to make here, number one, is pride. Guys, pride has to go. Like the Lord in our sanctification process is coming for our pride. And it's a hard one. You know, at the center of pride, and I'm sure you've heard this, is that letter I, right? And pride is a cancer to the human soul. Nothing is more destructive to humanity than pride. Pride is what kicked Lucifer out of heaven. Pride is what booked Adam on the first train out of the Garden of Eden. Pride is what thrust King Saul, the king of Israel, out of the kingdom. Pride destroys relationships, marriages, friendships, ministries, businesses, and even churches. And at this very moment in John chapter 3, what do we see here? At this point, pride is tempting John the Baptist. His right-hand men, his, his board, his elders, the people that were with him are coming and saying, John, our ministry is decreasing because everybody's going to Jesus now. Now, may that be said of us, right? Amen? Amen. May that be said that Jesus is made famous in the United States of America, that people are going to Jesus. But John the Baptist, you know, had a very successful ministry, and it wasn't because he was seeker-friendly, guys. Think about this. John the Baptist ministering in a hyper-religious place literally has this wild beard. He eats insects. He's got, you know, burlap on, and he, all he cries out is, repent, <laughs> repent. And the Spirit of God attaches himself to that. You know, I wonder, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to do? What do you feel ill-equipped for that you need to step into and believe God for? And he's at this Jordan River. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 through 9, we see the Pharisees actually come to John the Baptist, to his ministry, and John the Baptist will point them out. Listen, guys, I'm not pointing at any of you tonight. I'm just going to do randomly, right? But he points them out. He says, brood of vipers, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, the axe is already laid at the base of the tree. Man, God's about to chop you down. You know, it's amazing how the Lord blessed John the Baptist's ministry. And he, 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 I want to make this point because his ministry wasn't decreasing because John the Baptist wasn't doing what God called him to do or because John the Baptist wasn't faithfully preaching the word of God. He was. It was decreasing for another reason. And as John the Baptist is watching Jesus' ministry, as Jesus' ministry begins to overshadow his ministry, his staff is beginning to be concerned. And you're going to see John's response here. You're going to see how, how John realizes who he is. You know, brothers and sisters, in this day, you know, we, we, we have to be willing to let Jesus be at the front, you know. We're, we're, we're living in a day, I fundamentally believe what we are seeing happen in our nation and around the world, though, though it's being carried out by human instruments, I believe it, we are at a time that is so demonic. It is so straight demonic. I mean, the first time I went to Costa Rica and I started to see this, and then you hear the stories and you just go, this isn't human. 
She's not human. <laughs> First time you pick up the little seven-year-old girl who's, you know, just these, it's just unbelievable. And you realize this is not human. This is, this is satanic. This is demonic. You know, I think the things we're seeing play out in our nation around us, these are demonic. You know, uh, you know I'm, trying, I'm personally, as a pastor, trying to pray more. You know, and I don't pray enough. I'll be honest. I need to pray more because it's a spiritual battle. Like Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Right? Amen? Amen. And, and it's spiritual. And, you know, I know the reason why I got saved is because people were praying for me. My eyes were open. God did a supernatural work. And we need that. And John the Baptist here is realizing this, and he realizes who he is, and God is moving, guys. God is moving. But as God moves, pride has to go, right? Pride has to go. Pride is something that God will come after in all of our lives. He will come after it, and as you're being sanctified, you've probably already experienced this, you know, um, God will do this. Now, I want to make a point here. And I, I, I share this often at our church. And many of you probably already know this. You're the Wednesday night crowd. So you probably already know this. But in case you don't, I want to save you from becoming what I call being disillusioned with church. I think many Christians today are disillusioned with the idea of church gathering. I tell young people this all the time. They're like, I love Jesus. I just don't like church. And I'm like, well, Jesus loves church. <laughs> Jesus actually is his idea, the church. But I think one of the reasons we get disillusions, many people do, they become disillusions. Why? Because they assume these are all saved people. And I believe most people that do come to church, many are saved. Most are saved. And that's true. But then it doesn't mean just because they're all saved people that they are sinless people. You know, how many, how many sinners are here? Any sinners? Look at that. It's definitely Wednesday night. Because, you know, Sunday would be like, I don't know. I'm a sinner. You know. It's true. I'm just being honest. You know, I did a funeral recently in... Uh, I did a funeral for a man. He was a Mexican man, and it was in um, uh, Brooklyn, and uh, it was awesome. His, uh, his, his uh, daughter married uh, one of our guy's uh, oldest sons, and, and the guy who suddenly passed away, and we go down there. I bring my assistant pastor with me, who's Peruvian, and, uh, and I'm looking out at the crowd, and I'm just like, okay, a lot of Mexican people here, you know. And all I know is I know they're, I know, you know, probably 99.999% Catholic. Is there a higher percentage than that? 100%? I want to leave room for 0.001. And they're kind of, you know, you know, like they come in, they see I'm in a suit at the time, and they see me, and it's kind of like, oh, it's the pastor. And you could just feel like how they're faking religion at that moment. You know, it's like, God bless you, pastor. We're praying. I'm like, you're not praying. Come on, stop. And the first thing I said was this. I said, you know, you guys, I, I said to him, I said, I know I'm the pastor. I'm here. We're going to honor this man. I said, but I want to make sure you know this. I don't know if you guys think you're sinners, but I want to tell you right now, I'm a sinner. You can just see him kind of, huh? You're not supposed to say that. I was like, I'm a sinner, but I've been saved by Jesus. My assistant pastor shares how he's Catholic his whole life growing up. He gets born again. Jesus, you can see some people getting angry and some people cry and smile. And, you know. This is the truth, guys. When you come to church, it doesn't mean people are sinless. I'm going to tell you right now, they're not sinless. I'm not sinless. Uh, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. In fact, the Bible teaches uh, that phase two of the Christian process is sanctification. But what this is here, this is the place where Jesus changes us. He works in us, and, and he's going to grow us up and then use us and show us the purpose for our lives. You know, the purpose of life is a life of purpose, guys. It is. If you are waking up in the morning and wondering, why am I even alive? What am I doing here? It doesn't have to be that way. God made you for a reason. You have a purpose. God fashioned you in your mother's womb with something in mind. There are people on this planet right now that this moment do not know Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, I know it a thousand percent that the destiny is God is going to connect you and them. And God is going to use your mouth and use your heart to lead them to eternal life. In a million years from now, you will see that person in the kingdom of God because God just used you. And it's our privilege, right? But this is the kingdom. It's a sinners. You know, the church is not a society of the perfect. It's a society of the redeemed. That's what we are. This is who we are. And I don't apologize for that. You know, people say, I would go to church, but it's filled with hypocrites. And maybe, you, maybe you're here and you haven't been to Calvary in a while because you said this church isn't perfect. So you went to another church that you thought was perfect. And guess what you discovered? When you got there, you made it not perfect anymore. I'm sorry, I can say that, I'm not your pastor, right, you know, I can say that. It's the truth. 
John's disciples didn't understand this, but John the Baptist knew it. John's going to be an example. Watch this. We're going to move on. Verse 27. Now, John answered, and he said, he said, listen, guys, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. If you have your pen, underline that. Listen, if you have a ministry, wherever you are at in life, if God has blessed you with resources, if you have an ability to sing, I mean, you guys have a full band on Wednesday night. Give these people a round of applause. I mean, that's incredible. It's Wednesday night. There's supposed to be a guitar person, and that's it. That's all you could get to show up, you know. You guys have people, and then you got musicians in the back going, I wish I could play tonight. I'm like, it's Wednesday night. What kind of church is this? You guys are too Christian here. It's too many Christians. It's too many. But, I mean, it's amazing. I was blessed. But John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ. John is looking at his disciples going, I already told you, I'm not the guy. I'm not the Savior. You're not going to find eternal life in me. I can't do that for you. I'm not the Christ. But verse 28, John chapter 3, I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. Listen to that. John says, not only am I not the Christ, I'm also not the groom. You know, Imagine you're the best man at a wedding and while the bride is coming down and you're standing next to the, the groom, your, your best man is c- complaining to you. I can't believe you're getting married. I'm not even married yet. This isn't fair. What's wrong with you? I'm better than you. She should be my wife. You know, if I'm the pastor, you are fired. <laughs> fired. Next in line. Which one do you want? Pick me, 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 me. Okay, you're up. Now listen. Stop. You know, he says, I'm not the groom. I'm the best man. You're missing it, buds. You're missing it. I'm the best man. I'm not the groom. And John says, you know, uh, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. This is Jesus' bride. But the friend of the bridegroom, note this, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. Now listen, don't miss this. John here says, I rejoice greatly when I hear the voice of Jesus, of the groom. You know, I've had great, many great blessings in my life. You know, five kids. My, my wife is incredible. I'm blessed. I really am. I mean, God's called me. Uh, he's gracious towards me. But the great joy of life, and I believe this, at the core of joy, if you are going, I have a joyless Christian experience, I would say the reason why is you are not, you are not putting yourself in a position to hear God's voice enough. The joy of the Christian experience is to hear the groom's voice. It's when Jesus speaks. You know, I can recall after getting born again, I didn't know the difference between an epistle and an apostle, guys. It took me a year of my walk. I remember I was going to a small group Bible study, and this, this, uh, this gal, you know, basically says, oh, Peter, are you still smoking marijuana? I don't forget. Why is that wrong? God made it, you know. I was like, it's, crap. it's good for you. You know, you're just so stupid. And, you know, God changed me. But I remember I, was, I used to, you know, work out. Uh, you know, I used to work out on my back patio, and I, and I started reading my Bible, and I had a lot of trouble reading the Bible, a lot of trouble. You know, I just never really read much before, and, but I wanted to know God, and I remember God says, if you want to know me more, you got to read the Word, and I was like, oh, gosh, is there another way? Is there another way? And I listened to a lot of audio tapes back then. I had a Walkman. How many of you guys know what a Walkman is? Anybody know what a Walkman is? It's great. You know, it's great. Now, now, I have, now I have access to nothing. No, I, I know how to use this thing. But I mean, I was listening, but I, I was reading my Bible, and I happened to be in Jeremiah 29, 11, didn't know it was a famous verse. I'm working, I read it, for I know the plans I have for you. God spoke to me that day. You know, I remember I'm a Christian. My father married five times, broken, broken family, uh, all kinds of stuff. I'm, it's not my testimony tonight, but, but I just remember just thinking, all right, I'm a Christian, but Lord, I, can't, I don't have no future. There's no hope for my future. What could you make of me? I, my brain doesn't even work. I've already screwed up. My name is terrible. I mean, you know, it just was everything. And I remember the Lord speaking that to me. He said, I have a plan. I see a future for you. I had no idea what that meant. None. Zero. But I remember the Lord speaking it to me. It became kind of like my light verse thing, you know. I have a plan. You know what? God told the truth. It was true. He had a purpose. He saw all that I'm doing living now. But back then, God saw Daniel. God saw the little children. God saw tonight. He saw it all. I saw nothing. I couldn't even see. 
But God saw it, and he spoke it, and it brought joy to me. I remember going, this is kind of weird, this feeling of joy. You know, I knew what happiness was. I knew quick pleasure, quick pleasure, and then it went away, and it led to darkness and depression. I remember that. But I didn't know what joy was. I remember this joy came into me. It was the voice of the bridegroom. It was God speaking, right? And, and I want to remind you tonight, that's it. And John the Baptist says, this is where the joy. Brothers, he says, men, you're missing it. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the groom. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Verse, verse 30, he must increase. And this is the key verse. These are the seven words that will change everything. He must increase, but I must, what does it say there? Decrease. This is the truth. You know, if you heard a Christian message after you were saved, that fundamentally the spirit of it was, Jesus must decrease, but you must increase, that's the wrong message. It's not real. Uh, I, I fear a bit of Christendom today is teaching this message. That's not the way to what God has for you. The way to what God has for you is you must decrease, but he's going to increase. And the more he increases, the more blessed you'll be. Verse 31, look at this. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Verse 32, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Now, let's stop there. Listen, if you're, if you're taking note, it's number two tonight, as we talk about these seven words that will change your life. And it's John 3.30, he must increase, but you must decrease. But in this process, number two is you need to pattern after good examples. You know, some of the best examples I've seen in my Christian life are those servants that probably externally will never stand up here. But I've kind of learned those are the super Christians, you know. The ones that are kind of always humbling themselves, always decreasing, they're praying. It, it's incredible to see it. You know, John the Baptist was willing to be that man, to be that man that would take a step back to allow Jesus to take center position. And, and we have to continue to be there, to be in that place. Uh, number three, if you're taking note in this, is number three is let God use your life. Let God use your life. This is very hard. This is a hard thing. We, we all want to be used of God, but in that process, God, as he uses our life, is the one who's going to get the glory. He must get the glory. In the process of, of him increasing and us decreasing, it goes against every single fiber in our flesh. Everything. You know, um, I remember it was many years ago, uh, many years ago, and I was going through something very hard. Uh, there was a situation in ministry that um, was just so hard. It was just crushing. We just, and, you know, as a man, I just wanted to just, whoosh, you know, just, just handle it the way I wanted to handle it. And I remember I talked to your pastor. I talked to Pastor Bobby. And I was like, you know, this is the deal. What should I do? I'll never forget what he says. It was, it was probably the greatest advice I've ever gotten in my Christian life, ever. And he says, just bless him, Bill. Just bless him. I said, I literally dropped the phone. I pick him up. What? What are you talking about? What does that even look like? And he started to tell me kind of what it looks like. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> so I have to lie to this person to do what you're saying. He said, just bless him. Just bless him. I'll never forget. He says, all you need is God's favor. All you need is God's favor. Just bless him. Watch what God does. I'm going to tell you something. He was right. He was spot on. It was incredible. I was so grateful for that. I remember stepping into that. I remember stepping into it. As I was stepping into that, that posture of just blessing someone that was hurting, that hurt me, hurt my family, I remember stepping into it. I remember my just flesh just decreasing. Every part of my flesh was like, you know, screaming like a, like a baby. Ah, right? But I was just like stepping into it. But as I stepped into it, I watched. Man, my flesh was decreasing. Jesus was increasing. And man, was it awesome to watch God bless it. It was kind of like living out when Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and abuse you. You know, how many guys like that verse? I hate that verse. I hate it. You know, it's like, you never walk into somebody's house and you're like, there for dinner and you're like, oh, look at this beautiful scripture on the, on the refrigerator. Bless those who curse you. Pray for them. You don't have that. It's like, the Lord bless us and keep us, you know. 
<laughs> you don't go to Hobby Lobby and say, you know, you see the big picture. It says, you know, everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, it's like, they, they, they want to make a good poster. Nobody puts that up. You give it to your, you know, I can see a spouse giving it to their spouse. Oh, man, this is for you, right? <laughs> Nobody does that. But as we let God use our life, guys, this is what it looks like. It looks like God using our life. And sometimes, sometimes it's humbling, right? Sometimes it's humbling. Sometimes it's humbling. But humbling is good because then Jesus is lifted up. And I'm going to tell you, I remember uh, this verse in Romans. The first time I sensed that as I was reading Romans and God spoke this to me, God says, you know, as, if you put your trust in me, you'll never be ashamed. You won't be ashamed. Do you think those Christians in China that are being killed for the gospel or in India or most parts of the world right now, there's more persecution happening on planet Earth right now of Christians than ever before in human history. People are dying for the gospel. You think they're ashamed? They're not ashamed. The people killing them are ashamed. They will be. But they're not ashamed. Listen, let God use your life. Let him use you. Watch what God will do. Let's wrap this up tonight. Verse 31. Back to verse 31 or 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Seven words. It'll change you if you begin to pray that and say, Lord, do that in me. Verse 31, he who comes from above is above all. That's the Lord Jesus. And John the Baptist, he's pointing to that. John the Apostle is pointing to Jesus. He who is of the earth is earthly. It speaks of the earth. But he who comes from heaven, well, that, he's above all. That's Jesus. He's above all. Verse 32, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. God is true. Verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. Note that there. You know, John is saying here, listen, when, when God uh, blesses you with the Holy Spirit, it's not like a drop in your cup. You know, if you tonight say, Holy Spirit, would you come afresh upon me? Father, would you fill me afresh? God doesn't come over and drop like one little eyedropper of the Holy Spirit, that should be enough. And you're trying to drink it, you can't get it out. Abundant. It's abundant. God blesses us abundantly, guys. He loves us. He's generous. I believe God wants to bless every person in here tonight. Tremendously. Tremendously. Believe God for that. And he says, he says that here. He says, God does not give the Spirit by measure. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Jesus has all authority right now. Verse 36, listen, and this is the, the conclusion of everything. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. Why? Well, the, the wrath of God still abides on him. And it's our last point of the evening. If you're taking note, number four, number four is Jesus and only Jesus. And this is what John the Baptist is saying. Jesus and only Jesus ultimately leads you to everlasting life. That's what you need tonight. If you're here, you're coming, you dragged yourself in here, you're going, oh, I need a word from God. Listen, this is the word from the Lord for you tonight. You just need a little bit more Jesus. That's it. Just get a little closer to Jesus. Just get a little closer. John here says, listen, this one Jesus who came and he spoke to us, he, he didn't read this in a book. You know, some of the stuff I'm sharing with you tonight, I read, I read a lot of this in the commentary, guys, you know. I owe, I owe a lot of dead guys a lot of, uh, you know, endorsement money here, you know. I read it. You know, I, the best stuff I share, I, I didn't make this stuff up. I just read it and take it from them, you know. Because it's the word of God. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, guess what? Probably not true, you know. But, but Jesus, he, he, Jesus was there at Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, Jesus was there. Jesus was at Jonah and the whale. Uh, Jesus was there when the Red Sea parted and the children of Israel went through on dry land. Uh, Jesus was there in the creation account, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. Nothing was made that was made, right? Jesus was there. Jesus was the creator. He is the creator. He is God. And when he came to this earth, he didn't speak to us about stuff he heard or read in a book. Jesus spoke with authority. And when Jesus says, I can save a sinner, guess what that means? I can save a sinner. Save anybody. You know, we just had uh, last week uh, this, um, what is this, this solar eclipse thing, right? Now, listen, I didn't come here to make fun of you guys, but I'm going to. So, you know, 
I actually was speaking at a conference in the Northwest, and I get off the plane right as the solar eclipse was happening. All these people are lining JFK Airport, looking out the windows with these glasses on, and I'm, I'm like, this is great, because I thought I was going to have to wait in line and mess with I'm racing to get out of this place. Some lady goes, you want my glasses so you could see it? I was like, no, no, it's okay. Go to the window. The solar eclipse is happening. I was so glad. I was just like, wow. You know, and then I got home, and my wife was like, oh, we were outside with the glasses looking at the solar I was like, oh, I couldn't tell her. You know, she'll listen tonight, though. She'll find out what I thought about it, you know. But it was just kind of funny. But, you know, as I was thinking about it, this analogy came to me. You know, and obviously I'm a pastor, so I come up with an analogy from every single thing that happens in the whole world. That's just how it works. And, uh, you know, like the sun and the moon, the moon looks wonderful at night, guys. It looks wonderful at night. You know, when the, the sun is reflecting off the moon, when you see it in a dark sky, it's wonderful. But all the moon is, and you guys know this, all the moon is is a giant ball of dirt. <laughs> you know, we saw the moon in all of its splendor without the sun on it. It's like, wow, that is a really dirty, big thing. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I, I, I'm not trying to be mean to you, but all we really are, apart from the light of the sun, is a, some of us are bigger than others, but we're just dirt. You know? <laughs> like David literally says, who am I that you're mindful of me, right? Who am I? I'm just, I'm but dust. It's all I am. It's a man that understands himself. A woman understands himself. But, but when we're properly aligned with the sun, it's a good thing. But listen, in the morning, when the sun begins to regain strength, though it's, what, 93 million miles away, at sunrise, the moon has to diminish so that it gives light way to the light of the sun. Right? I think the church today, I think we have a bit of a problem. And I believe we got an analogy of that problem. You see, what we had the other day was called a solar eclipse. The moon had eclipsed the sun. And it's nice for a moment, but if the moon stayed in the position of eclipsing the sun, we would have been ready for the rapture, wouldn't we? <laughs> okay, you know, they didn't say this on the news. And I think right now, too much of us as believers, too much of the church, are eclipsing the light of the sun. We've got to get out of the way. You know, and I don't even know how to do it, but I say, Lord, you know, like Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 16, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. You know, we've got to really say, Lord, as I go out, and I don't think that means we don't do anything. I think we've got to get going. I'm a big church, let's get going person. You know, God, in the, when he parted the Red Sea, before he did, and Moses is there going, Lord, what are we going to do? And Moses thought he was so spiritual. He looks at the children of Yeshua and goes, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Remember that? And then he goes to the Lord, apparently in prayer, and he's like, Lord, what is going to happen? We're going to all die. You read the text. This is how it goes. And the Lord basically says, what are you doing? What are you crying about? The Lord says two words. Go forward. Imagine that. Moses looks to the right side. There's a mountain. The left side is a range. Behind him is the army of Egypt, and then there's the ocean. So the last place he thinks he's going to be going forward to is the ocean. He probably thinks, all right, we need to, all right, let's pick up our sticks and attack the Egyptian army. And the Lord says, no, put your, put your little stick, your staff over the ocean. Watch this. Go forward. You know, it's like we, we got to get back to that place, guys. You know, whether maybe it's going to be to go, go minister to, to these children and come alongside of what God is doing. I believe God... I believe personally God is looking. He's not ready to come back just yet because people are still getting saved. And I believe God is seeing all these children, and this is just a drop in the bucket, getting, getting raped and just horrors. And I believe God is saying, I want to use my kids to rescue my kids. It's special. But this is all these types of things. We've got it in our own communities to go and to bring the gospel. But, but we've got it. The, the eclipse has to, can't be, right? The moon cannot eclipse the sun. It can't be. It can't be, guys. And John ends with this last thing, he who believes the sun has everlasting life. Listen, this, this salvation is eternal. Like, whether you know me that well or not, and maybe you don't even like me, and that's okay, right? So we get to heaven, just say, Lord, I want to be as far away from that Pastor Billy guy as possible in heaven. He'll accommodate you, you know? <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, we're going to know each other 500 years from now. We're going to heaven, guys. Like, this is real. We're going to heaven. 
And the reason why we're going, nobody's going to be in heaven and everybody's going to be worshiping. And there's Jesus and you're going to be standing next to Jesus going, yeah, give us some more worship. Right? It's called hallelujah, not hallelujah. You. It's, ha- it's not hallelujah me. It's hallelujah. Yeah, it's praise to God. And we're going to get there. And this is what it says here. He who believes the son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the son shall not see life. But notice here, but the wrath of God abides on him. And I think we struggle with this, the wrath of God. You know, the other night we were in a midweek service just like this, and there was a lot of rain outside, and all of a sudden in the middle of the service, boom, the lights went pitch black. Our sanctuary, similar to this, it was you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You know, and right as I was sharing, before the, all the power, in the, you, could, you could hear the children screaming in the children's wing. You know, we got multiple guys like, ah! You know, I was like, that's awesome. I loved it. I was like, that's great. Because I was thinking about the children's workers and how they were like, what do we do? And I just, I just got a kick about it. I was like, that is so great. You know, I was like so happy to be the pastor at that point and not have to be the five to eight-year-old teacher, you know. But, you know, I, I was in the midst of talking about something. The Lord, because I know so many people have trouble with the wrath of God. I have no trouble with the wrath of God. You don't have trouble with the wrath of God either. You just think you do. I'll tell you right now. Let me, let me paint this picture. Let me, let's say, let's say you have two children, three children, whatever, one child, and let's say somebody had stolen your child, and they had their, your child in their basement, and they were torturing your child. What wouldn't you do to get them out? Would there be anything, would you go to the door and say, hello, is anyone home? I just want to be godly. If you did that, you're not godly. (laughs) What wouldn't you do to rescue your kid? Seriously. Would there be anything that you wouldn't do to rescue your kid? I've got no problem with the judgment of God. God is looking at this world. He's looking at people being like this stuff we're talking about tonight. He's looking at believers. He's coming, folks. And he is going to, he's going to handle the business. You know, like you're going, what is he talking about? Just read Revelation tonight as a nice little bite, bedtime story, right? <laughs> You'll see. The Bible says the blood will come up to the horse's bridle. And I've got no problem with it. I'm a dad. Somebody takes my kids and they're torturing them. You, be, you better be able to handle it because I'm coming. I'm going to do everything possible. You have to rip my arms off and my head off to stop me. And God Almighty, he is coming. He is coming. He's going to rescue his bride. He's going, to, he's going to rescue those that are being tortured and raped on this planet and sexually exploited. Jesus is coming, guys. And he's going to handle it. But the beauty is this. This is the beauty. Before he comes, he sent his son, Jesus. God the Father sent his son, Jesus. He says, man is sinful. And he sees humanity tonight. And uh, do you guys usually close in a song on Wednesday night? Yes, if the worst funeral, come on up. You know, he sees, he, sees, he sees mankind, and he sees us sinking in our quicksand of sin. And rather than coming, God the Father doesn't pronounce judgment. He's not coming. He's not condemning this world right now. That's why the world is so shocked. Because they're going, well, God's not condemning us. Well, he's not going to condemn you just yet. And he comes, and his response to man's sin was actually giving his son Jesus. You understand? But if you, even if you're here tonight and you've never said yes to to Jesus, I want you to know this. God loves you. He does not condemn you. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But listen, listen close. But if you see what, what we did to Jesus, if you see the sacrifice for your sins, which was God's own son, Jesus Christ, and you despise it, you say, you know, Lord, I know that was your plan for salvation, but I want to go to heaven a different way. That's not good enough for me. It's not going to work, guys. It's not going to work. If you despise what Jesus did for you, there's consequences for that. But I want you to know tonight, God doesn't want you to. He loves you. He loves me. Just, just think about this. You think I'm too much of a, you're too much of a sinner to come to know Jesus. This is me after 25 years of the sanctification process. I'm still a sinner getting changed by Jesus. You know, you don't believe me. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. She'll be like, he needs a lot of sanctification, you know. And, I, and it's true. But I know the Lord loves me. I know he's patient with me. I know he's changing me. But I want to encourage you tonight. Listen, if you've never said yes to Jesus, 
Just surrender to him. You don't got to do nothing special. You don't even have to go, well, I got to clean up my life first. No, you don't. That's impossible. What you do is right now, right now, right this second, you say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you're God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead. I want to follow you from this day until forever my life's yours. That's it. You just give your life to him. Lord, start a work in me, and then he'll take it from there. Just stick with him. Those seven words. Listen, that's the process. He must increase. Brothers, sisters, we've got to decrease. We've got to get out of the way of the sun so it can shine. Right? Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand together? We're going to close in a song. Yeah. Very good. And at the end, uh, close us in prayer. All right. Let's worship together.
God, we do. We praise you. Lord, we thank you that that's who you are. You are generous. You are selfless. Lord God, it's hard for us to humble ourselves before you because you're so humble, Lord. You force us to, to be low, to quiet our hearts, Lord, to, to come. And, but Lord, it's so amazing because as we come to you, Jesus, just as uh, you said in Matthew 11, you said, come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you told us of who you were. You says, I'm meek. I'm gentle of heart. So Lord, even tonight as we, as we just have been in your word and we've been in worship and been in fellowship, Lord, even, this, even after we leave here tonight or we fellowship, Father, you're among us. As Revelation says, you walk amongst the golden lampstand. You are here where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of you. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Oh, Lord, I just pray. I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, in these treacherous days, that they would be filled with the Spirit of God. I pray that you would bless them with a revelation that to decrease, Lord, is how you increase. And that, Lord, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, you'll find your life. God, I pray, Lord, just bless us. And in this last, uh, I believe, this last generation, this last moments before we hear the trump of God and the dead in Christ rise and we meet the Lord in the air and we'll forever be with you. We're to encourage each other with that. Lord, in these last days, Lord, God, I pray that we would not be those that are in the stands as spectators buying the popcorn and waving the big, you know, felt finger, Lord, but that we would be those that are in the game, Lord being used of you. Lord, whether we're going to go out of this country or whether we're going to go across the street, Lord, whether we're going to, Lord, find ourselves becoming a pastor or being called to the ministry or, Father, at the ShopRite checkout line, we're going to tell the person about Jesus. God, I just pray just you would continue to pour out your spirit here at Calvary Chapel, Lord, throughout New York. And, God, we just love you. We praise you. God, thank you for your presence with us tonight. Thank you for honoring your word. Thank you for the work you have begun in us that you tell us I am faithful. I will be faithful to complete it, Lord. And we are confident of this. So God, just bless my brothers and sisters. Continue to move among us and through us. And we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Listen, following the service, I know uh, Daniel's going to be around. He'll be in the foyer. I'd love for you to connect with him. You know, uh, just his, his uh, website is called Thrive Vision. Uh, Thrive